Okay, so uh, Azima two is our uh, Azima <laughs> is our next speaker. Uh, sorry, I she was my student and uh, I always call her Azima, but the name is Azima two. So our next speaker is Azima two. Uh, the floor is for you. Oh, thank you, Garu. So uh, this good morning and uh, good afternoon. So I'll be talking about atomic and electronic structure of cesium metriodite surfaces. I'm currently with Alto University and uh, in the physics department. So um, cesium metriodite is uh, a perovskite material and perovskite was uh, discovered somewhere around 2010. And within a short time of its discovery, it has um, uh, the efficiency of uh, perovskite has increased and currently it's almost close to the most um, um, efficient solar cell material, which is the crystalline silicon. And um, aside from its uh, stability, aside from its efficiency, perovskite materials have so strong light absorptions uh, and they also have the ability to transport both electrons and holes. They are very easy to fabricate at low temperatures and they're sustainable and then above all, very affordable. However, despite all these uh, properties of the perovskite material, its commercialization has not been realized yet. And this is due to our uh, stability issues. Mainly the perovskite material is not stable in ambient conditions. And we also have problems with the transport layers uh, the most common transport layer, which is um, currently known and which has also given the perovskites its uh, current efficiency is the spiral metage, which is a whole transport material. But then this material is uh, an organic compound and uh, it's very unstable in a UV uh, environment. So in order to be able to achieve uh, the commercialization of perovskite materials, we need to find ways to uh, enhance the stability without compromising the efficiency of the material. So perovskite uh, materials are materials with the ABX3 structure, uh, where you have the A site being occupied by an inorganic compound or an organic compound. Here, mainly the um, inorganic compound that is used is cesium and then the most common organic compound that has been used so far is the methyl ammonium. And then you have the B site being the, uh, the central atom within the octahedral. And this uh, is usually occupied by lead or tin. And then you have the X site, which is uh, occupied by halide anions, usually bromine, chlorine, or iodine. In this uh, structures, we have iodine as the uh, occupying the X site. Now in a typical perovskite solar cell structure, you have the uh, perovskite active layer being sandwiched between a P-type and then an N-type conductor with um, a transparent conducting oxide through which the sunlight is uh, transported to the perovskite active layer. So in order to protect perovskite from uh, ambient conditions, we would need to protect uh, the layers, uh, the surfaces of the perovskite with the coating material. But as we see here, having a, a conductor as well as a coating material thickens the layer between the um, transparent conducting oxide and then the active layers of the perovskite. And this can uh, reduce the efficiency of the perovskite since the light rays have to travel through several layers before reaching the active layer of the perovskite. However, we can uh, protect the perovskite without compromising the efficiency if we are able to have um, a coating that can also serve as uh, a conducting material. So here you have uh, almost the same uh, thickness in there and then you have um, a, uh, a P-type conductor which also has the capabilities of protecting the perovskite from um, the ambient conditions. So in my previous work, we set out to look for inorganic coating uh, materials, which have the ability to also serve as uh, transport materials. 
So we assumed a perfect uh, interface where the interactions between the perovskites and then the transport or coating material is perfect. So we didn't even uh, consider what happens within the surface. And then we did a database search. So what we did is to take an already existing database, the Airflow database. So at the time of this uh, work, the entries of the Airflow was almost 2 million. And then we set out some criteria to select uh, potential materials that can serve as coating materials as well as um, uh, conducting uh, layers for the perovskite. So here we set out to have like six uh, criteria. First of all, we needed to find uh, materials that have wide band gap. And uh, mainly because if you have a wide band gap material, it serves as a window material uh, for the perovskite. So in this case, we're looking at uh, semiconductors and also insulators. And uh, the entries of the A-flow are all calculated with DFT. And um, as we all know, GGA has uh, this um, underestimation of the band gap. So we set our criteria to select um, materials with band gap that are greater or equal to 1.5 EV. And uh, we also restricted our search to binary and ternary compounds because we didn't want to have any uh, higher dimensions that would have complicated structures for the um, uh, for our uh, constructions. Then we also had um, uh, wanted materials that are abundant and non-toxic. I know here people are going to hold me with uh, the fact that lead is already toxic, but then it's in the perovskite. So we wanted to reduce the toxicity by making sure that our uh, coating materials are not toxic. And we didn't want materials that were also interacting with water, because as I said earlier on the perovskite disintegrates, mainly the, mostly the organic uh, perovskite disintegrates when it gets into contact with water. And uh, based on the lattice uh, structure of the perovskite, we wanted surfaces that have like a cubic kind of structure. So we also restricted for appropriate lattice. And then we calculated the lattice mismatch between the uh, selected uh, coating materials with 12 different uh, perovskite structures. So we had uh, six uh, inorganic uh, perovskites and then six organic perovskites with uh, different combinations of the halides. And then we ended up with uh, 93 potential coating candidates for the perovskites. So the actual goal of um, this whole project is to uh, model a perovskite material that is uh, robust and also efficient with the ability to withstand uh, harsh ambient conditions. But then in, uh, in, a, in, in an ideal situation, we know that the perovskite and the coating are not perfect. So there is this issue of the interface, what happens when you have uh, another material on top of the on top of a different material. So to be able to achieve this, we need to understand what happens at the interface. But then we cannot understand what happens at the interface if we do not understand the surface uh, properties as well as the possible surface reconstructions of the perovskite. So uh, the main uh, subject of this talk is going to be based on the surface properties of uh, cesium lead triiodide. So here we use density functional theory and also ab initio thermodynamics to study the surface of uh, cesium lead triiodide. For the uh, GFT part, we used um, the FHI AIMS uh, package. And then we looked at the two by, a two by two uh, supercell of the perovskites along the 001 plane. So we looked at the two different uh, terminations. So if you look at this uh, structure, for instance, you can see that the topmost layer is uh, cesium, is terminated by cesium and iodine. And then the next layer is terminated by lead and then iodine. So we looked at these two different terminations where we have cesium iodine term iodide termination, and then we also have lead iodide terminations. And then we made our slab to be symmetric uh, because we didn't want to have the interactions of adjacent uh, slabs in the model. 
that can induce some dipole interactions. And then we looked at the cubic and then the orthorhombic phase of the cesium lake triagonite. So uh, here we have the alpha phase and then we have the gamma phase. And then we also, uh, we use PBE soil in all our calculations because it uh, gives a better estimation of the uh, lattice uh, constants. Then we also, aside from considering a symmetric slab, we also included dipole interaction corrections to uh, avoid any dipole interactions in our calculations. So to cut that computational cost, we fixed uh, the all uh, we fixed layers uh, within the bulk and allowed just the symmetric uh, endings of the uh, material to relax. So as is seen here, and then we looked at surfaces with uh, missing and add atoms. So the surfaces with missing atoms will be represented by V substrate X, and then the ones with added is I substrate X. And the X here are the constituent elements, and then we also consider the complexes. Uh, within this um, element. So uh, for the results of this calculation, I'm going to take you through the surface diagram analysis of varied surface reconstructions, and also the electronic properties of the clean and most stable uh, surface reconstructions. So if we uh, neglect um, finite temperature uh, interactions, then um, we can find these, uh, we can calculate the stability of a surface using the grand uh, potential. So um, a special case of this is when you have um, the system interacting with its constituent elements in their stable states. So here we have the um, grand potential and then we have the energy that we calculate from uh, DFT. And then we subtract the uh, removed or added um, uh, constituent elements by calculating their chemical potential. So this is the chemical potential of the I uh, atom or uh, compound. And then we have, um, so this um, is the DFT, uh, is calculated from DFT. And uh, this is the most stable, um, uh, the most stable um, structure of the um, uh, constituent elements. And then X is the number of added, uh, the number of the elements within the structure. And then we have this uh, parameter here, delta mu i. So what this delta mu i does is to uh, find them, uh, if in case you shift uh, the, uh, the value away from the most stable uh, value of the mu, what happens? So this is more like a control for the uh, calculation. So in a special case, you can uh, calculate the formation energy by uh, just subtracting the um, energy of the calculated from of the surface you have uh, modeled from the, um, the sum of the um, chemical potential of the uh, elements that you have removed or added. And here we consider delta mu to be zero. So this is more like the uh, state whereby the um, whatever element you're adding or rich, adding is rich. So delta mu equals zero. So here I have the surface phase diagrams uh, from the alpha phase in this case. And then here, what we did, this is a three dimensional problem, but what we did is to split it into two. So we consider um, a state where we vary the chemical potential of cesium and then the chemical potential of iodine. So here the delta mu PB is zero. So from here, we have this uh, white line which we label as stable bulk. And uh, as stated by Stefan in his uh, presentation, the bulk is not in isolation from the surface. So in order to be able to find the most stable surface, you need to consider uh, if the surface is stable within the bulk. So here you see that in regions where cesium is poor, you have the structures that are deficient in cesium. So all these surfaces are surfaces where we've removed uh, cesium atoms. But then uh, what is of interest here is the surfaces that intersect 
with the uh, stable book, those ones will be the most stable. So if you look at this side, for instance, even though uh, the surface space diagram shows all these surfaces, they are not the most stable surface. And then we have here, we have a clean surface to also be stable. And then we have all these surfaces that intersect the stable bulk to also be the most uh, stable surfaces. Then we also considered a region where delta mu c is zero. And then here you see that as uh, you move towards the lead rich region, you have uh, the surface that has uh, more cesium atoms on top to be the most stable. So in all, we can say that uh, the surfaces with added four cesium iodide are the most stable ones if you look at the coverage area of the um, calculation here. Then we looked at the uh, oh, yeah. surface phase. You have five minutes. Okay, then the surface phase diagrams of the uh, gamma phase. Again, we see a similar pattern as we saw in the alpha phase. And then the most stable surfaces are the same as what we saw in the um, alpha phase. And then also at delta mu CS, we see the same kind of uh, configurations. So we went ahead to look at the band uh, structures, what is happening there. So here we looked at a bigger uh, slab model because we wanted to rule out quantum confinement. So we, this is a bigger slab where we didn't relax the system and then we computed the, um, the band structure which is projected onto the bulk. And here we see that they are perfectly aligned the, 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 the clean surface is perfectly aligned to the uh, bulk. But then after relaxation, we realized that there are some surface states. So we have the edge of the conduction band being pulled into the gap, which shows a uh, presence of surface state. But then with the gamma phase, we don't see uh, something like that. And then obviously the band gap of the gamma phase is wider. And then this is the brilliant zone that we use for our calculation. Then we also looked at the um, band structures of the most stable surfaces. And again, we see surface states within the alpha phase and then, but then there are no surface states within the uh, gamma phase. And uh, again, uh, the, we don't see any states within the gap for both cases. So uh, in summary, the, we've been able to show that uh, from our SVD analysis that the cesium iodide terminated surfaces are the most stable and the uh, surfaces with um, cesium iodide and lead iodide are the most uh, stable reconstructed surfaces. And this is because these um, surfaces do not induce any uh, 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 polarity within the uh, structure. And then, so there are no induced deep energy levels in the gap. And as I said, the gamma phase is more favorable because you don't see any surface states uh, at the edges. So there are no band edge perturbations. So for my current work, which would focus on now looking at, now that we have uh, most stable surface uh, reconstructed models, it is time to look at the uh, interface and then uh, conclude the modeling of the structure. So here we combine DFT and then the machine learning program for the uh, appropriate surfaces of the material of the perovskites and then the coating to see which ones are good. So here I have a uh, uh, strontium, strontium zirconia on uh, cesium lead triiodide. And uh, so we use this uh, Bayesian optimization structure search. This is a code that is developed in uh, Alto University. So what this does is that it uses um, data that you have fed into the system and then it will use um, Gaussian process regression and then it selects the, uh, it scans and then gives you the most um, stable surface for with a lower energy uh, level. So it gives you a landscape of the energy, as you can see here. So this is the data acquisition point here. And here we have the uh, landscape. So this gives us the most um, stable configuration. And then this is the relaxed uh, structure of uh, uh, strontium zirconia on uh, cesium uh, lead triiodide. 
And this is another example of zinc oxide on uh, cesium lead triiodide. On this note, I'd like to acknowledge um, the um, Finnish Academy of Science and Letters and then Academy of Finland for funding. And then also uh, Novel Material Discovery also for funding. And then CS Center for Scientific uh, Computing for the computational time. And thank you very much to the organizers of uh, this conference for giving me the opportunity to present my work. Thank you for your attention. Yeah. Thank you very much, Azima, for the nice talk. Uh, the floor is open now for questions. Uh, Ali, you can start. Okay, thank, thanks a lot, Gar. Thank you, Azima, it's good to see you. <laughs> I had, a, I had a two questions. Uh, the, the first one is um, uh, in your surface reconstructions that you talked about, mm -hmm. have you, um, I guess you, you just looked at uh, zero Kelvin optimizations. Yes. Yes. Uh, is it known experimentally, for example, um, uh, how annealing the surface uh, changes uh, surface properties? Because you know, temperature may play a, a very important role in the in the morphology of the surface. So, so, so that was um, that was the first question. The second question is related to that, which is, uh, what is the role of temperature in uh, in the band gaps in these types of systems? Okay. So. Temperature can really have a, a serious effect on this. And uh, as I said, as part of the uh, ambient conditions that are not conducive for perovskite is temperature, okay? So that is the reason why we, in the interface calculation, we like to use wide band gap um, materials because they have the ability to kind of absorb more temperature. So that would help in protecting the perovskite. But then in this case, we haven't considered temperature. So of course, there would be some changes in the uh, band gap. And that is why we have considered several reconstructions to see which ones are the most stable. Because well, in experiments, unlike um, in modeling, you can control what you put in and what you put out, right? But then in experiments, it's really difficult to control such uh, things. So yes, there could be an effect on the band gap. Okay, thanks a lot. Welcome. We can continue the discussion on the, yeah, on the discussion, I mean, on the uh, discussion session. Uh, I would like to check with Hisham. Hisham, can you hear me, please? I think his microphone is still not working for some reason. Okay, probably then uh, the next speaker is uh, Abdo El, El Fiki. Can you hear yes. me, please? Yeah, yeah, I hear you. Abdo? Okay, so probably then uh, we can we can go with uh, your uh, presentation. Okay. And then we will check uh, Hisham later on. Okay. 